Over the last several decades, greater emphasis has been placed on the relationship between religion and science. What, if anything, do they really have in common? Both seek to explain how our world came to be, and beyond that, to try and give us a glimpse into the purpose, if any, behind existence. It seems any attempts to reconcile the two may be a lost cause, at least as we believe our religious views to be today. One concept recently proposed by science, the holographic universe theory, is no less unseemly from a rational perspective than any of the more unfamiliar religious ideas from around the globe which appear quite strange to us in the West. Take me, for example. I seem real enough, don't I? Well, yes. But surprising new clues are emerging that everything you and I, and even space itself, may actually be a kind of hologram. That is, everything we see and experience, everything we call our familiar three-dimensional reality, may be a projection of information that's stored on a thin, distant, two-dimensional surface. Sort of the way the information for this hologram is stored on this thin piece of plastic. As we seek this understanding of how we apparently came from out of nowhere, religion and science differ greatly on the how part, if not the why. Mr. Faith in Physics presents The Holographic Universe. For the vast majority of mankind's history, we have relied on religious interpretations, myths, and the supernatural to explain existence and man's place within it. Comparative theologists have the task of exploring the wide range and degrees of religious variations on a theme. We came into being through the actions of supernatural beings, or a single being, desiring it to be so. Arguments and conflicts abound in the theological world and decisions are made to resolve issues with doctrine, which depend more upon opinion than scrutiny. As time passed and more issues became of concern, more doctrinal decisions only mounted upon previous opinions, creating an elaborate set of opinions, which were of little observational value. We were far away in time from the understanding of the scientific methods or at least of having a harsh and realistic assessment of what could be known of existence at that time. Our world, we were taught by religious dogma, was created by God or gods from various substances, usually water, and in various orders, depending upon which cultural and religious views you take. Reviewing the many beliefs on creation, most of which may seem strange to cultures unfamiliar with them, serves a great purpose in itself. All peoples, the torturous reality asserts, have no less certainty about their views as we do here in the West about our own. This is no game of who has the right mythology. There is something quite wrong in the state of deity and supernatural creation when left to isolated cultural evolution there was near zero agreement among the varying tribes of man and revealing little if any truth as we know it as a fixed and established fact in any of their beliefs. There are some odd and unexplained similarities, some of which are very revealing, and these will be addressed in other presentations. But for our consideration of what the physical nature of the universe is, it seemed religion was only bringing confusion to the developing minds of modern peoples, in particular the new breed of religious adventurers. Then with the advent of the Renaissance, which in turn may be a reflection of a mere rediscovery of an earlier technological time, we develop, ironically enough, the scientific method as led mainly by the Roman Catholic Church, as we mention in more detail in our About Us video. 
Being dissatisfied with the limited explanations offered by any individual religion, it fell upon these people, these new scientists, to develop and maintain rationality and sanity. And in this process, it seemed, faith itself could become objectified as a process, with trust that the universe, as an indifferent yet specifically refined process, knows what it's doing. The flow of discovery from religious ideology to reasonable and physical consideration of the stuff of which we are made is an interesting one. This path, at least in the West, leads, from the early Catholic Church as noted, to the Church's problem of an inaccurate calendar. Astronomy and the study of the very heavens itself were promoted and financed heavily by the papacy. From this renaissance of reason sprang forth methodologies which snowballed into modern-day physics. What these early astronomers found was a consistency of order in a vastly larger universe than ever imagined. So with much chagrin, the Church, facing glaring inconsistencies between biblical traditions and these new discoveries being made, turned wrathful against the early scientists who suffered as a result. However, their discoveries were yet to find any real answers to the questions of primacy until the beginning of the 19th century, when things began to get really exciting, observationally and theoretically speaking. It was in the opening years of the 1800s that our first real shocker in modern exploration of stuff came. As far back as 1803 and possibly earlier, scientists made some very disturbing observations and for almost 200 years, physicists' conclusions have remained mostly confined to discussions with other physicists, so bizarre is its premise and implications. Perhaps they were hoping that something would prove their findings wrong, but nothing has. Their discovery was the now famous double-slit experiment, which had revealed nothing less than a glitch in reality, which no one, then or now, was much prepared for. This discovery is also referred to as the wave-particle duality because it showed conclusively and as a repeatable procedure that matter exists in both the state of a wave, or more correctly the wave function, a mathematical procedure physicists use to measure it, and a particle, or the more solid piece of stuff that most of us think of as an elementary particle and what it might look like, which form it took acting like a wave or acting like a particle, and here's the kicker, appears to depend not upon a fixed and pre-existing physical condition, but on whether or not it was being watched. It changed its behavior based on the unintuitive and purely relational condition of whether an elementary quanta was interacting with some kind of conscious observer or not. There is plenty of information on this experiment available, so let's focus on the implications instead. To continue, we see that essentially what we are is waves, or a wave function, with only probabilities of being in any state or condition until something interacts with it, and that wave collapses into a particle, which now has a measurable state. There are many videos on YouTube that say the universe is a hologram, and that everything is just an illusion. And here we are, the granddaddy of all quantum weirdness, the infamous double slit experiment. To understand this experiment, we first need to see how particles, or little balls of matter, act. If we randomly shoot a small object, say a marble, at the screen, we see a pattern on the back wall where they went through the slit and hit. Now, if we add a second slit, we would expect to see a second band duplicated to the right. Now, let's look at waves. The waves hit the slit and radiate out, striking the back wall
with the most intensity directly in line with the slit. The line of brightness on the back screen shows that intensity. This is similar to the line the marbles make. But when we add the second slit, something different happens. If the top of one wave meets the bottom of another wave, they cancel each other out. So now, there is an interference pattern on the back wall. Places where the two tops meet are the highest intensity, the bright lines, and where they cancel, there is nothing. So, when we throw things, that is, matter, through two slits, we get this, two bands of hits. And with waves, we get an interference pattern of many bands. Good so far. Now, let's go quantum. <laughs> An electron is a tiny, tiny bit of matter. Like a tiny marble. Let's fire a stream through one slit. It behaves just like the marble, a single band. So, if we shoot these tiny bits through two slits, we should get, like the marbles, two bands. What? An interference pattern. We fired electrons, tiny bits of matter through. But we get a pattern like waves, not like little marbles. How? How could pieces of matter create an interference pattern like a wave? It doesn't make sense. But physicists are clever. They thought, maybe those little balls are bouncing off each other and creating that pattern. So they decide to shoot electrons through one at a time. There is no way they could interfere with each other. But after an hour of this, the same interference pattern is seen to emerge. The conclusion is inescapable. The single electron leaves as a particle, becomes a wave of potentials, goes through both slits, and interferes with itself to hit the wall like a particle. But mathematically, it's even stranger. It goes through both slits, and it goes through neither. And it goes through just one, and it goes through just the other. All of these possibilities are in superposition with each other. But physicists were completely baffled by this. So they decided to peek and see which slit it actually goes through. They put a measuring device by one slit to see which one it went through and let it fly. <laughs> But the quantum world is far more mysterious than they could have imagined. When they observed, the electron went back to behaving like a little marble. It produced a pattern of two bands, not an interference pattern of many. The very act of measuring or observing which slit it went through meant it only went through one, not both. The electron decided to act differently. As though it was aware it was being watched. And it was here that physicists stepped forever into the strange never world of quantum events. What is matter? Marbles or waves? And waves of what? And what does an observer have to do with any of this? The observer collapsed the wave function simply by observing. This particle is today thought of as a vibrating string, and the way that it vibrates determines which particle it represents. Keep in mind also here that when we're discussing string theory, that when we're discussing the size and space within the elementary particle that most of the space, the confines of the elementary particle being a vibrating string is mostly empty space and that extrapolates on into larger scales as we'll see in a moment.
So while the added value weirdness of quantum physics was still a century away, already there was trouble in paradise. Matter, at its basis and least reducible part, seems to know when it's being watched, and is in this way called into being by the existence of the observer. Anthropic reasoning. Some cosmologists still see a greater meaning in our existence. They do not agree that we are coincidental to the universe. The universe, they argue, is irrelevant without us.